On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Artemis 1 returns home in the most extreme way possible, Blue Origin goes all in on a second lunar lander contract, and SpaceX launches Hakuto and Rashid rovers to the moon. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. Artemis 1 is safely back home. On December 11th, the mission's Orion capsule, which had spent the previous 25 days in space testing systems while orbiting the moon, came screaming into the atmosphere, suffering strains and temperatures so high that NASA wasn't completely sure if the vehicle would even survive. Using a new re-entry plan that skips the vehicle off the atmosphere like a flat stone across a lake, Orion was able to make it through the atmosphere and land inside of a planned area of the Pacific Ocean at exactly 12.40 p.m. Eastern Time, just as NASA intended. This re-entry maneuver actually made the landing safer and much more accurate than the Apollo missions, and to see why we have to look at the physics of returning to Earth from the Moon. The Earth and the Moon are both moving around. The moon is pulling on the earth while it orbits us, and the earth is likewise pulling on the moon as the whole dance orbits the sun. Luckily, the earth and moon have a pretty stable orbit, and so we rarely have to worry about strange interactions. But the way our gravitational forces interact means that any craft coming from the moon has a very small window to safely get back to earth. Normally, falling back to Earth is easy. You just lower your speed under 28,160 kilometers per hour and bam, you just fall out of orbit. But to break out of lunar gravity, you actually have to accelerate. This is what takes re-entry from a relatively gentle fall from orbit to nervously trying to hit a small target area so you don't blow up or fly off into space. This Keyhole is a target that a capsule's trajectory has to pass through to successfully enter the atmosphere, and it's only 24 kilometers wide. It's the sweet spot where the angle of a vehicle's descent is not steep enough to destroy it with the heat of re-entry, but not shallow enough to just skip off our thick atmosphere and never come back. An older analogy that has been used to help visualize this is to think of the Earth as a basketball and the moon as a baseball. At that scale, the two balls would be placed 6.7 meters apart, and the keyhole for safe re-entry would be no thicker than a piece of paper. To be fair to NASA, they are very good at hitting that paper-thin target. All of the Apollo missions returned safely that way, but it was not an easy ride. While NASA scientists knew the math they needed to plan out better re-entry plans back in the Apollo era, their guidance computers weren't powerful enough, and so re-entry for those crews was more or less uncontrolled. NASA could only get them through the atmosphere, not choose where and when they would land with any accuracy. The US Navy had ships standing by to quickly get to the landing site once NASA had regained contact with the pod. They knew the rough area it would be in, but not close enough to not worry about the astronauts' safety. In the case of Apollo 8, for instance, the pod splashed down in the Pacific at 4.51 a.m. Hawaiian time, and they were forced to wait for rescue until sunrise due to danger of sharks. Imagine being the first people to orbit the moon and then getting attacked by sharks once you're home. So, now that we have advanced guidance computers and the ability to digitally model and test new procedures on the ground before we ever try it in orbit, NASA decided to try something they can control a little better, something called a skip entry. I know we just talked about the danger of a vehicle coming in too shallow and skipping off the atmosphere, but this maneuver is actually a pretty slick bit of physics work. Initially, the Orion capsule was moving at about 32,000 kilometers per hour, just a little slower than Apollo 11, which came into the atmosphere at around 38,000 kilometers per hour. It dove to about 61 kilometers altitude, building up over 2,700 degrees Celsius on its heat shield due to atmospheric friction. Then, it did a flip. The capsule rolled 180 degrees, using the shape of its body to skip back up to a 99 kilometer altitude, basically back into orbit again. But at this point, the vehicle has bled off so much speed that it's just falling back to Earth. The skip entry does two very crucial things. 
The first is that it splits the re-entry into two periods of descent. This lowers the amount of time the heat can build up on the heat shield by giving it a brief cool off period. It also makes the drop easier on any crew. During the Apollo missions, the average re-entry would require the crew to sit through 6.8 Gs of force, which isn't enough to injure a properly prepared person, but most people black out at around 4 Gs, just to give an example. And that's exactly what the skip entry does. By skipping off the atmosphere on the first part of the drop, the capsule bleeds off speed and makes the overall G-forces softer, coming in at about 4 Gs. The second thing this maneuver does is it allows NASA to much more accurately plan for a landing zone. The plan for splashdown on December 11th was to land Artemis 1 about 80 kilometers off the coast of San Diego, California at 12.40 p.m. Eastern Time. That very specific target is only possible because of the modern guidance computers that ease the capsule through the skip entry. And they hit it. Splashdown was at exactly 12.40 p.m. Eastern Time, and while they didn't hit the exact location, they were within 300 kilometers of it, splashing down off the coast of Baja instead of San Diego, which was done on purpose to avoid a pocket of bad weather. And with the tracking and guidance computers feeding NASA back data, it wasn't a surprise as to where Orion was coming down. After a smooth descent, Orion stuck around for about two hours in the ocean to test some extra systems, like its beacons and ammonia boiler, which would keep the crew cool if they were forced to stay in the capsule longer than intended. But observers reported no damage to the capsule and everything was working perfectly. Artemis 1's whole mission profile is filled with these physics tricks NASA has learned since the Apollo era. Every time the vehicle took a wider orbit or plunged into a potentially dangerous dive, it was always attempting to take advantage of our environment to boost efficiency. The fact that Artemis 1 completed its test run so perfectly is no small feat. And once all the data is sorted through, we look forward to seeing it happen again, this time with a crew for Artemis 2. Billionaire Jeff Bezos and his rocket company Blue Origin are back in the saddle announcing that they've submitted a bid for NASA's second lunar lander contract. The news that Blue Origin would be reassembling their team of all-star engineering firms to compete again came on December 7th, almost nine months after NASA's March 2022 announcement that they would be seeking bids for a second lunar lander. The first contract was won by SpaceX in 2021, with NASA awarding the company almost $3 billion to design a lander version of their prototype Starship vehicle for use on Artemis 3 and 4. The selection of SpaceX seemed to get under Blue Origin's skin, and a protracted legal battle ensued, with SpaceX coming out on top. It's lucky for Bezos that NASA prefers to have redundancy for just about everything, and so his company has another shot at landing a lucrative NASA contract of its own in the next year or so. Like last time, Blue Origin has opted to submit its bid as the head of a team rather than solo like SpaceX. And it's likely that gathering this team and getting their first draft ideas together is what's taken them nine months to submit their bid as there's been a couple of changes to the team since the last contract attempt. The roster for this time is aerospace giants Lockheed Martin and Boeing, space systems company Draper, who worked on the Apollo missions and will be providing software, guidance, and flight systems, Astrobotic, a Pittsburgh-based robotics company that will be launching its automated lunar lander Peregrine on a United Launch Alliance rocket in early 2023, and Honeybee Robotics, another robotics company that was acquired by Blue Origin in January 2022. Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee are all new to the team, with Boeing replacing Northrop Grumman, who had been in charge of developing the lunar transfer stage on the last go-around. Now, don't feel too bad for Northrop Grumman, though, as they've entered the contest as well, teaming up with Dynetics, another former competitor, it looks like those two are likely going to stick to Dynetics' more stable-looking design, but that is all we know at the moment. With SpaceX out of this race, the Blue Origin team has a much clearer run at the contract, and with the shakeup in the team, we're probably going to see at least a slight redesign to their previous lander. Whoever wins, their design isn't likely to see use until Artemis 5, so they definitely have some time to get a great design made. And NASA is absolutely correct 
to source out a second lander design, it's always good to have a backup. Japan and the United Arab Emirates are about to join the very exclusive Lunar Lander Club, as rovers from both countries, plus a NASA ice hunting satellite, were shot to the moon aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket early Sunday morning. After some delays to do additional safety checks, SpaceX was able to lock in December 11th at 2 a.m. Eastern Time to launch their Falcon 9 rocket. The mission had originally been intended for November 30th, but... It's better to be safe than risk losing this sort of package. The Japanese Hakuto-R commercial lander will be transporting both the Rashid, a conventional wheeled rover made by the UAE, and a transformable lunar robot, a 250-gram baseball-sized rover that unfolds to drive around like a Star Wars droid. The incredibly light robot was made for the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, by iSpace a Japanese space startup that JAXA is looking to partner with in the future for their pressurized lunar cruiser idea. This will be the first time both countries have landed a vehicle on the moon, something that's previously only been done by China, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Both rovers are there to conduct some experiments, with Rashid opting to study the lunar dust or regolith and the JAXA rover exploring the surface. Both countries are using this mission to test technologies for future missions. But they won't be alone, as NASA is also sending a little small sat hitchhiker. The lunar flashlight is about the size of a suitcase, and will detach from the other payloads to move into a near-rectilinear halo orbit, a super-efficient orbital path mapped out by the Capstone mission, which arrived at the moon on November 13th. In this orbit, the lunar flashlight won't need to pack much propellant, which is good because it's intending on using a new, eco-friendly monopropellant, a fuel which can burn on its own without having to lug an oxidizer around called Ascent, or Advanced Spacecraft Energetic Non-Toxic. <coughs> Flashlight's main mission, though, is to act like its namesake and shoot beams of light, lasers, into deep craters and crevices on the lunar surface. If the beam gets reflected back, no water. If they are absorbed, there could be some solid water ice there. Each of these missions is so important to build our functional knowledge of the lunar environment and our own tech. With so many international missions headed to the moon in the next decade or two, we're likely to see more of these sorts of tests in the near future. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.